do you ever have just too much stuff pulling on you and and you just wish life weren't quite so complicated? Now, I'm a retired guy, so I should have plenty of time, right? All of us should, whether we're working or not. It just It just shouldn't be that way, but it is. And if we've not decided what our first loyalty is, this sort of normal complication of life, too much to do, becomes far more complicated. There are those days in which, you know, we can be like the uh, proverbial donkey that's both hungry and thirsty, and it stands there, and there's a bucket of water here and a bucket of oats there. It starts going this way, and then it starts going that way, and then water, oats. Water, oats, where do I start? Well, having a first loyalty helps to organize everything else. Doesn't make the problem go away entirely. No, the only thing that makes the problem go away entirely is, well, I haven't found it yet. If you do, please let me know. That would be just great. But, you know, just the other day, while I was thinking about this sermon and the importance of putting God first in my life, well, there was weeding that needed to be done in the garden, and I wanted to talk to my wife just because I like talking to my wife. She's a nice person. And um, I was getting a little bit hungry, but I was trying to lose weight. And, um, and then, just as I was getting, getting ready to go out in the garden, the phone rings, and now there's somebody to talk to. Just a little bit too much. You know what I mean? And yet life is not really meant to be that difficult. And, and many times in my life it's not. And I hope the same is true with your life. But sometimes, sometimes, it's just a little bit too much. And this has been going on ever, ever since, ever since there were people. I think. I remember in college having to read this uh, piece about, um, written by some Greek, uh, and I've forgotten who wrote it, but it's evidently famous. My professor thought it was anyhow, and it was all about getting up in the morning. You have this to do, and you have to do, and you got to put on your sandals, and you got to pick out the right robe, and then what do you eat for breakfast, and then. And the guy was saying, it's all just too much. Now, the children of Israel were feeling that way when they're out in the wilderness. They've been there for a little while now. God had brought them out of slavery. God had brought them through the Red Sea. You would think everything was just hunky-dory. But it wasn't. You know what they were doing? They were missing their own life. Here they are out in this wilderness. They had to learn a whole bunch of new stuff. And one of the things they had to learn was they were going to have to go and fight people for their livelihood, for land that they could grow stuff on and to protect it. Hey, the Egyptians had taken care of all that. Being a slave wasn't that much fun, but they didn't have to go out and fight people for heaven's sakes. And they had to make their own decisions, and they had to develop their, their own society, and who was going to run it, and how were they going to rule it, and who's going to be important, and who wasn't. All that is just too much. It's just too much. And so Moses was talking to people for whom life was just too much stuff. When speaking for God, he said, Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, Yahweh, is your God. Yahweh is your only God. Well, when you have a first loyalty, then you know that whether you want to go back to Egypt or you're going to go forward towards the promised land, you're going forward towards the promised land. That's already been decided. And so the impulses that you have to go back, you deal with them, you dismiss them. And, um, gee, what am I going to do today? Well, I better get some manna because I want to eat. And um, 
Anyhow, it structures your life to have a first loyalty. It almost doesn't make any difference what that first loyalty is. They almost all of them make life simpler. I say almost all of them because the worst first loyalty we can have is to follow our hearts. You want to know why? Because our hearts go this way, our hearts go that way, and sometimes our hearts go that way. If we try to follow our hearts, we just can't. Other than that, other first loyalties other than our own heart generally simplify our life. Now, they may not take us places where in the end we want to be, but they do simplify life. And that's really the theme of today's thinking, of today's message. Putting God first simplifies our life. When Jesus was speaking, he was speaking to people who had been caught up in the, the early years of the Roman Empire. And for many, it was a very exciting time because you see, Rome created enough peace so that people could open stores, so that they could cross entire countries safely. Right now, there are people in America who would give their eye teeth for a little peace in their neighborhoods. But with peace, all of a sudden, there was the possibility of a prosperity they hadn't known before. And so when Jesus spoke of the Shema, and he did several times, one of the times that he did, he said this, and this is from the Sermon on the Mount, the sixth chapter of Matthew, verse 24. Jesus said, now, remember this. No slave can serve two masters because he's going to hate the one and be and love the other. He'd be devoted to one, and the other one he'll dismiss as being unimportant. He'll despise. That's what the word despise means. Look down our nose at it. It just isn't very important. It just does not come up to the level of being even seen in my life. And that's just the way that it is. No one can serve two masters. Jesus was so brilliantly, simply direct. It's true because it's true. Now, there's all the stuff that and the people have heard enough sermons. They know that they oughtn't, shouldn't be chasing after this. They shouldn't be chasing after that. They got to watch how much alcohol they drink if they drink at all. They have to remember what bedroom they belong in because that can get you in a lot of trouble. Now, money is the love of money is the root of all evil. Well, at least a lot of evil. We know all this. But when Jesus says you cannot serve God and wealth, he's saying you can't serve God or anything else at all. Even stuff that seems to be respectable. We're being divided in our loyalties, divided in our loyalties, forgetting who it is that gives us freedom, who it is that brought us salvation, who it is that understands who we are and what life is all about. When we forget that, we get ourselves into trouble, guaranteed. I was in new in this church, been there about, oh, three months, and I went to visit this woman. Oh, she was delightful. She was just absolutely delightful. And when we finished our conversation, she said, I wish you'd known my husband. He died six months ago. Well, every time I visited her for, for the next year and a half, she'd end the same way. One day she ended in, uh, I lost him two years ago. And then she looked at me, and she kind of shook her head. And, as, and I said, what do you want me to understand? She said, well, really, since he went away, my life has just been one endless to-do list. I get up in the morning, I have this to do, this to do, this to do, this to do. Hey, it's OK. Some of it's kind of fun. Go to bed tired. It isn't all done. I wake up in the morning, and the list is just as long. And I go do that, too. I've been doing that for two years now. 
and faster it's getting old. There's more to life than an endless to-do list, isn't there? And I said, well, of course there is. And then she said, every pastor dreads this. Then she said to me, what? I need to know. Uh-oh. This is not the time for the simple glib answer. It just doesn't work. She was asking from her heart, and this was important. So I said to her, I said to her, what I do myself when I just don't know, because there are times which I just don't know. I said, well, it's going to sound simple, and it is, and it isn't, because this is called waiting on the Lord. You ask God what it is that you need to know. You ask for guidance. And then you wait. And your mind goes wandering off. You just call your mind back with the same question and you wait. It's called waiting on the Lord. In your case, I suggest that the question you ask that you need to be asking God is, Lord, what do you want me to be doing with the next chapter in my life? She said, oh. That's right, God has a plan for my life, and this is, I'm in a new chapter, and I don't know what I'm meant to be doing. I said, yeah. Yeah, you're just asking, God wants you to understand. Give it a try. I promise you, it'll work. Might take a couple of weeks, might take a couple of months. Now, if you're as dumb as I am, or as thick-headed, whichever the case is, it might take a lot longer than that. But God will give you an answer, I promise you. Okay, she says. Probably work better than nothing. Work better than what I've been doing, so I will. I called her up about three days later and asked her how she was doing. I said, oh, well, great. I'm doing it every day, except nothing's come yet. And I said, I, I told you it may take time, because you may not be ready for the answer yet. God always respects our need when we need time. But when you're ready to hear, you will, I promise you. Well, that Sunday, she came up to me during coffee hour. She'd been smiling through church and catching my eye. And she came up to me afterwards and said, you know, it didn't take so long after all. I guess I was ready. So I, I spent two years mourning my husband. That's a long time. So I guess I was just ready. You know what God said to me? I said, no, but I want to know. He said, look, you love your daughter, right? Both of them. I said, yeah. And then I realized what God was saying is I was allowing my loss of my husband to count more than the love of my daughters and my grandchildren. And my friends, some of my friends I went to high, I, I went to elementary school with. I've known them my entire life. And that's exactly what I was doing. I was saying, well, they're just fine. I'm glad you're in my life. But for me, missing your father is more important than being with you. So that's a terrible message. And the light just went on. Says, this is not God's plan for anyone. God is kind. God is generous. God has put these beautiful people into my life. The problem isn't God. The problem isn't even the fact that my husband died. The problem is I'm counting my loss more, of more value as being more important to me than them, the living. Oh, she said. And I just felt this weight go off. A little change in attitude. And big weight went off. When I got home, I called my two daughters. I got one of them. And while we were talking, you know, it was, it was, it was really fun talking to my daughter. I'd forgotten how much I missed enjoying her as a person. I always did, and until I lost my husband. 
And when we're done, she said to me, Bob, you're different somehow. Something good has happened in your life. And I was actually kind of shocked. And after I hung up, I realized what it was, that God had shown me that I actually valued the people in my life more than my loss. Jamie, I could just kind of feel my husband's smile. It was like he was saying, I am so glad you're letting yourself love our daughter. And I'm so glad that you're going to let yourself love all of our friends, because I loved them too for many years. And we'll have time together. This is your time to be with them. Bless you. Just thank you so much for that prayer. Hey, isn't that our greatest joy, to be able to share a little something every once in a while with another that opens their eyes, a little change in attitude, and all of a sudden, a weight goes off, and joy increases. What more can we ask? So when our lives get complicated and we don't know which way to go and we're like the donkey, you know the donkey with the water on one side and the oats on the other. Am I going to drink? Am I going to eat? Am I going to eat? Am I going to drink? What am I going to do when we start getting that way? Somehow, some way, we're allowing something to intrude between ourselves and God's love, because within God's love, things fall together. Outside of God's love, things get too complicated. Just pray the prayer. Lord, what do you want me to understand for today? And wait on the Lord. If your mind wanders, bring it back. Ask the question another way, Lord, what do I need to know? What would you like me to see? Lord, what am I not hearing here? However you ask it, just take five or six minutes a day, as many days as it takes, 10 days, 20 days, 100 days, sooner or later, God will show you his plan for your day today. God bless you. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks that you are so faithful and that you bring so much good into our life. And sometimes we get distracted. Sometimes we get overwhelmed. Sometimes we get sad because of our loss. Sometimes we get nervous because we can't control the future and we don't know what's going to happen or when it's going to happen. All these things get in the way. And when all of these loyalties to take care of ourselves and protect our family and provide for ourselves and provide for other people and do this and do that, and I, I, I get to be too much. Just remind us of how grateful we are when we allow you to be God and for your love to organize our life. These thanks we return in Christ's name. Amen.